world and why it's so important. So when we're talking about talent management strategies, we'll look at, at what it is that we can do, some practical aspects and some key themes that have come out over the last few, um, I guess, months and years as things have started to change uh, in this, in, in this ever-changing environment that we're working in. I know, I know a number of you do know me because uh, we've met before, because I recognise your name. So thank you very much for coming again and joining us. Uh, those of you who are new, we do feel free to use the chat. We try to keep the chat going so that we can make this a little bit interactive for things. So if you've got questions or comments, feel free to use the chat as we go through. So my name is Lucinda. I'm a Chartered Psychologist. Um, I have spent many years in corporate learning and development roles. But of course, uh, everything is so different. So one of the things I love about my role, which is my day job is founder and CEO of Actus um, Performance. One of the things that's great about it is the fact that um, I get to talk to other people who are doing similar roles and understand how different things are um, since, uh, since I was in an internal role. So just in case you don't know, for those of you who haven't joined before, Actus Software, which is the business that I work for, we offer a complete performance talent and learning management solution. Um, we've got some really exciting functionality coming out next year. We've got uh, off the shelf 360 feedback, which is something we already did provide, but something which has really been um, designed if people didn't want performance management or have got performance management, but want to do some form of um, 360 feedback. So keep an eye out for that. That's coming in January. Uh, and we have bolstered our training courses, and I'll tell you more information about that at the end if anyone does want to know anything about this. But, you know, virtual training, I saw a report um, this week about from Mind Tools talking about the importance of continuing hybrid or virtual training. People don't necessarily want to be in classrooms for days on end. So we will be continuing our management series, our hybrid manager training and our virtual change superior training. And we have also got a new um, course starting next year uh, called Impact and Influence. And that's aimed at your high, high potentials, I suppose, but people who aren't yet line managers that are looking for other types of development. So all of that is information. If you want to know more about that, we'd be delighted to share that with you. But that's not why you're here today. Let's focus on why you're here today. So um, Actus, in terms of our learning outcomes for this module, we want to um, just reflect on why it is that hybrid working can actually introduce a risk really for talent management and an engagement. And you'll have heard terms like the great resignation and there's lots of um, areas out there or aspects to it out there that people are aware of. Um, and it's wondering whether that's real or not actually. And I think it is real funnily enough. I've, um, uh, I'll, I'm, in, I'm doing a podcast later today with a guy called Mervyn Dinnan who's written a book on this and has just done some research in terms of it. So certainly it does seem that uh, talent retention is something we all need to be aware of in 2022. So we're also going to be able to look at um, uh, practical ways in which we can engage talent, because obviously if it's retention is important, engagement of talent is important, the role of the line manager and visibility and involvement of remote talent. And I've broken that down into five steps to give it a structure that we can focus on. So just warming us up and getting us all a little bit involved, here's my poll question. I've just got one poll for you today, but I'm interested in your thoughts. What or how would you define talent in a current workplace? And I've got three options here for you to choose one of these three options. Um, but and, and you, if you want to choose one of those, great. Uh, if you're not sure, then uh, feel free to be able to put your comments if one of these are not quite right for you. But let's get a sense of how people perceive talent. Uh, and it's interesting to see whether it's moved on or not. Okay, we've got half of you participated. So a few more seconds, decide which one you're going to go for. And for those of you who've already answered, because I'll share this um, results in a moment, so 62% participated. Um, if you, with the answer that you've gone for, because it's quite, uh, there's a quite a lot of consensus looking at the results so far, um, would you say that this is how it was five years ago, or would you say that this is related to a hybrid workplace? Well, I like that definition, Brenda. 
Brenda thinks that talent is someone whose growth patterns are aligned with business objectives and organizational resources. So someone who can grow and contribute um, in line with where the business needs to go. Right, okay, so any final ones? I'm gonna, I'm gonna count down three, two, one. Any final votes, please go for it. Um, and then I'm going to end the poll now and share the results. So as you can see here, the vast majority of people felt that it's about identifying key skills from people and getting the most out of them. So you see it as talent could be everybody. Uh, some people feel that it is about various pockets based on key skills aligned to business need. And very few went for select five or 10 percent of your employees based on performance. Now, it's interesting because I think back to my corporate days and I would have said that talent management 15, 20 years ago was closer to A and B. Uh, but I feel that maybe now and particularly in a hybrid environment, we need to move more to C. That's my hypothesis. Let me know in the chat whether you agree with that. Would you say that thing or have you always been about everybody? Uh, does anyone have a different view on how talent is or should be viewed in your organisation? You do, Linda. So, yeah. So do you think it's, it is now more about everybody? Because my, my hypothesis is that it needs to be more about everybody because it's a higher risk in the hybrid environment that we can lose skills. Whereas before we might have been quite elitist. I'm not saying that that was right, but we might have been quite elitist about skills. But now, actually, you've got to be thinking much more broadly about these flexible skills and what we need from the work um, from the talent in our organisation. So while well, keeping my eye out, if anyone wants to add any thoughts as to what it is in your um, organisation and whether it has changed due to being hybrid. Um, and then I'll keep an eye on that chat. Um, but in the meantime, this is what, I was, what, what my view is, that hybrid working is a bit of a, a double edged sword now um, when it comes to talent management. So I think that what you can find is the really great thing about it is people can work from everywhere or anywhere. So we can, in theory, engage and, and recruit talent from places geographically that we wouldn't have gone for. Of course, the downside of that is so can other businesses if they're going to allow hybrid working. And I was talking to a large professional services organisation yesterday and they were saying that um, a lot of their grads that would have had rented flats in London and things, uh, they have now, because of the pandemic, they've given up their flats and they now are living all around the UK and they are not necessarily prepared to come back and rent again. Does that mean they can't have the job? Does that mean then, you know, how does, how does that operate? It's fine if you've got in, um, offices all over the place, but all of a sudden, uh, geography has both opened up our access to talent, but it's also opened up talent's access to other businesses. So that's an interesting one. So it could be recruitment opportunities, but it could also be a disadvantage. Let's have a quick look. So um, Linda's saying, yes, everybody needs skills to work in a hybrid way, and we need to be able to get best out of everyone, particularly with resources being tight. Definitely. Yes, Vicky, the, years ago, 15 years ago, focus was nine box uh, matrix. Absolutely. Some people still talk about that as the, uh, you know, just the, where they want it to be, but it wasn't always used effectively. I think that was always the challenge is people actually knowing how to develop people as per the nine box. Um, and I haven't actually got an image of that here, but I think often people would just think about the people in the top right corner as being talent. But actually, it's more about, I would argue now, it's about looking at the skills in every area of a nine box matrix, wherever people are, what the skills they have and how we can develop them to maximize them. So in terms of those um, risks and opportunities, I'd say to talent, what we have to think about is the geography, how can we can harness this in terms of geographic flexibility. Um, we need to think about whether or not the culture that we've established in our organisation or are establishing, and if we've done nothing, we shouldn't pretend that cultures are not establishing because they'll happen without us. Have we got collaboration um, that's happening in the organisation? What about the management style of the leaders and managers in the organisation? Can we see people with skills and are we allowing them to network and share and develop those skills? And do we have career development pathways in place uh, to help with that? So the first food for thought, the first thought that I would say, uh, which is worth considering is, are we actually um, embracing geographic 
flexibility or are we paying lip service? Are we listening to our people? Are we in an, an organisation where people are insisting that people go back into the office? Like, you know, regardless of new variants of COVID, is that the emphasis? Or are we embracing it where we're actually um, collaborating with, with people and identifying where they want to work and allowing them to have some flexibility in terms of that? Certainly, uh, anecdotally, the sort of feedback is coming from people that the businesses that are embracing it um, are less likely to have talent drain. Um, some of the statistics that came out of it. So 88% of people who worked at home during lockdown wanted to maintain it to some capacity. Certainly, I'm sure many of you will have done surveys in your own businesses, have you? Um, what I'm seeing or hearing from our clients more recently, that, that's, that was 2020 data, um, is that it's probably 20% of people, a significant minority really do want to go back to the office, but 80% of people still want a level of flexibility. So if that's taken away completely, uh, then a lot of the gains that they feel they, they've had are, are going to be lost. The other thing is productivity. Some people really feel they are as productive, if not more productive at home than in the office. And then you add on the commute, they feel less productive, which is unsatisfying. Um, some uh, evidence from EY was that 50% of employees would actually quit without flexible working, which is the high risk when we think about vacancies. Again, in terms of your, your organisations, I spoke to an NHS trust yesterday that has got 800 vacancies, which shows 10% of their workforce. Well, how can you function with that? So I'm hearing that it is difficult to recruit. Is that your experience? And interestingly, um, now this was pre-pandemic, was that 92% of younger people in the workplace wanted to work flexibly, and that was in 2019. And that'd be interesting because I've, often it was the younger people who were said to um, be maybe in uh, multi-households uh, multi where they had less, space to go and work remotely but even so they would still want to have flexibility they don't necessarily want to be in the office all the time so first thing is just actually have we embraced it we're now into close to two years aren't we of this so uh, have have we embraced allowing people to be flexible and and negotiating win-wins with our with our people from the point of view now of talent retention, that the sort of things that people are asking at interview, again, tell me, is this anyone thing that you're asked? Certainly I'm um, hearing from the people I work with is that actually the opportunity to work flexibly comes up regularly from the candidate's point of view. So are we doing that sort of thing in terms of our employer brand? Are we presenting ourselves as an employer brand that is prepared to be flexible geographically um, and to trust people to perform or are we presenting ourselves as a bit more staid and we've got to, we'll be going back to normal and, um, you know, and this is how it has to be? Because it may well be that that is going to affect our ability to attract and retain talent. Then I think it's about our culture of collaboration. So if we are going to continue to work in a hybrid fashion for the foreseeable future, how do we get around this? lack of ability to communicate this difficulty in collaborating how do we ensure that some of that human contact still takes place well one aspect to be aware of is that a lot of it can come down to the way our managers manage us um, or you know fundamentally we can talk about broader networking in a moment and other opportunities there but it's so important that our managers are just modeling good regular people performance management conversations and um, activities. So we did some, some research in 2021 and you can see the gold bar on the right is where people are saying it was more important um, in terms of them working when you're working remotely and the red bar is equally important, blue bar is less important. And essentially what that's telling you, some of the way that you can't read it easily because of the way the um, and long words that popped out at the bottom. But basically, the only thing that was seen as slightly less important in terms of management behaviours, they talked about was actually um, performance issues. But the vast majority of these activities were seen as at least as important, with regular check-ins or one-to-ones being seen as significantly more important, recognition and praise significantly more important, and coaching and development conversations. So it's about that 
keeping people focused, talking to them frequently enough. Um, you know, and when we went, first went into the pandemic, people were talking weekly, but that probably is now stretched out. So has it become too much stretched out? Are we still recognizing and praising people? Well, were we in the first place? But why is that more important in a remote environment? Is that about people feeling belonging, about them feeling valued? Because you're not seeing people on a day-to-day -day basis and perhaps you don't have the ad hoc informal conversations that would have happened previously around the coffee machine where you share a bit about yourself. Recognition and praise maybe has stepped into it being more important. And also coaching and development conversations. So helping people to feel that they are progressing and having a sense of purpose. So if you look at the wider things that keep people in an organization, it's your relationship with a line manager in terms of engagement. It is about feeling valued for doing a good job and it's about opportunities to learn and grow. Those are always about engagement. So I see that now in a hybrid environment, lots of those, it's harder for some of those to happen. So there's more of an onus on a line manager to do it. So Mike is asking a question. Does anyone see a connection between the great resignation and the lack of feeling part of something bigger as a result of the isolation of working remotely? So what do you think? Does anyone see a connection there? I would certainly say, Mike, when you look at the research, I did a podcast episode, we'll put it on the show notes um, afterwards, which one it was, uh, with a lady who's done some research about belonging at work. And I certainly do think whether it's about something bigger, which is also about people, that's a bit about employer brand and buying into long term vision of what an organization is doing. But it's also having that sense of belonging. And if we're not feeling part of, of, of something bigger than ourselves, being part of that team, then definitely that's one less thing that's going to keep us in that organization. It's going to take away that loyalty, um, makes it much more of a transactional relationship, potentially, unless we can achieve that belonging more effectively by working remotely. So Linda's agreeing with you. You're saying that that's, that theme came across, did it? <clears throat> Lack of feeling part of things. Is this what we're saying, guys? Lynn, is that you felt? Oh, well done, Caitlin. She's just popped the um, episode in. It's quite interesting about that, about belonging. So I suppose really what we're saying is how do we give people a sense of belonging when they're not getting it by walking into an office? I mean, it's funny, really, because you could argue, why do you really get a sense of belonging by coming to an office? But it's that maybe informal conversations, the sitting around chatting, it's being with people, companionship, maybe feeling part of something. How can we recreate that when everybody's spread around the country, um, you know, in their own home offices? And Robert's seen some um, thing about the company culture had deteriorated. So does it have to deteriorate? I don't know. I mean, I, I think it is, is moving on because lots of people, lots of people feel that they don't want to give up the being at home piece either. So how do we build a sense of culture and belonging without that? Well, my, my sense is that we have to try harder. Um, and again, a lot of this comes back to line managers. It does. It is about developing our line managers. We know that um, line managers are not always particularly we're not great necessarily at creating um, belonging and teams and giving people perform a focus uh, when we were in an office environment. So their skills need to be even greater and their commitment to people management needs to be greater uh, in the in this strange new world that we find ourselves in. So Tori is saying that connection was the greatest theme in your recent employee survey. <clears throat> the importance as a number one profession for your priority for your team, social and professional. So connection. So that's what you're saying, getting people to connect, Tori. And again, any ideas, um, pop in there, guys. So um, yeah, I'm talking about it from a people management point of view, but you know, it doesn't have to be purely people. There's lots of other ways we can get connection, but this is the key. How do we get it? Who tell us what you're doing in your organization? Has anyone got any great ideas that they're happy to share with others? The um, people management culture, we've been talking about this for a long time. Uh, in terms of uh, thinking about putting people first. If we're going to have a sense of belonging, we have to, we can't suddenly go back to being transactional. We have to make sure that we understand uh, the people that work for us, what they're bothered about, what's interesting to them, what makes them feel connected. We have to do our normal performance management activities as line managers, but we need to do more recognition and more coaching and support. So those are the first two points. I'll keep an eye on the chat, hit some good chat. <clears throat> Um, and suggestion going on here. 
But then we need to think about, and maybe this is something if we're in HR roles, which a number of you are, that we can help with. So how do we give visibility of skills when you're not physically seeing people? Is it about us thinking in terms of our talent? Do we have uh, visibility of key roles or positions that might be essential to business survival or how we actually deliver the business strategy? So we need to make sure we understand those in terms of allowing, allowing the business to be sustainable and continuing to perform. We also need to think about in terms of um, talent, which roles might require specialised knowledge or skills that are going to be particularly difficult or expensive to recruit. So these are almost as, as proactively identifying the high risk skill areas where we need to put some extra energy into them. And the other areas, of course, are there key individuals? So sometimes you've got roles or positions which have key skills, but sometimes you've just got people, let's say, who's be, who, who've been, if you're in a technology business and someone's been here 40 years, they may be, they might just have unique knowledge about a legacy system that no one else has got and no one's been trained up with recently. So sometimes also you have to have an eye and ear on those key individuals that have been here a long time. Now, that's not to say you don't want to think about skills more broadly and helping people to develop, but it is useful for us to think, right, what skills can we see and should we be proactively ensuring that people with those skills are being supported? We're giving them that sense of belonging. We're ensuring that maybe through a talent programme or a development programme where people are going through things in cohorts, albeit virtual cohorts, does that help? Is that something we can do to support people? Yes. So exactly, um, Mike, I really agree with your point. This is, this, again, it's another double-edged sword. Mike's saying the irony of our current situation is that people want to work from home, but it has a detrimental, potentially has a detrimental effect along their sense of belonging. Do people realise the importance of social interaction work? Or, you, or do they consider that They'd rather, if there was a way the two up, they choose working remotely more important. It's actually a fundamental shift in the psychological contract, I believe, and that we are finding that people, as, as employers, as, as businesses, we can't assume that we have the power anymore. The power is very much with the individual, so we have to almost negotiate win-win reasons for people to stay connected help them realize why they might like that sense of belonging why would they get what would what is important to them is it about career progress um being part of a team having a laugh with people from work helping them to recognize that um, and encourage them to engage with it so we have to maybe talk to people to help them so do they realize the importance of social interaction maybe maybe not or actually maybe it's just something we have to have that conversation about actually and get people to acknowledge we do need to get together a bit or do you think we need to get together a bit or at all help people to think about the impact of their actions because we've got quite comfortable in staying out of the office haven't we at the moment and again this time of year with new variants that makes it harder and harder to tempt people to come in so Brenda's question is, do we as talent learning HR leads have the duty to educate and shed light on that? Or should we adapt and replace traditional face-to-face -face interactions with new solutions? Anyone got a view on that question from Brenda? My personal answer, Brenda, would be that the answer is yes to both. <laughs> I think we do have the duty to educate, um, you know, help people to think about their you know, what they're missing out on and their responsibility. For example, in many businesses, they're finding it harder to bring on, you know, really young people to train up interns and things like that. If you're someone whose role it is to support and bring people on, then actually it's part of your responsibility in your job role to make yourself available um, some of the time. You know, it doesn't have to be at a drop of a hat, but some of the time to support that. And that's part of us contracting with people in terms of what we expect from them. Uh, in terms of their, their, their support and working with others. Um, but equally, do we go for traditional face-to-face? -face? Do we need to? When you think of the benefits of what we can do, think about, uh, think about a training course, a typical training course where you might have to spend two days and then two days off-site, completely out. And what often happens, those of us who are in learning and development, uh, a business emergency arises and that person can't afford to take two days out of the office altogether so they don't attend the training at all. Whereas if you have more of a hybrid or a virtual solution, it's much easier for people to find a couple of hours here and there 
um, in order to attend it and wrap it around their day. So why wouldn't we want to make more use of those sort of um, approaches? That's just my thinking, but what do others think? Some great, great comments here from people in the chat. So then um, if you want to give people a sense of belonging, sense of aspiration, sense of a career progression, you could think about defining virtual career pathways and making them more visible and accessible to people within your organization. Now, you may have come across a book called The Leadership Pipeline. It's about 20 years old now, but it's actually a really good book about how you can uh, develop talent up a pipeline and think about developing leaders of the future. But it doesn't have to be just people managers. It could also be people who are specialists in certain roles. And why this is important is that it's about giving people a vision or a sense of progression, um, which can, again, give them a sense of belonging. So if we want to give people a sense of belonging, a, a sense that they're going somewhere so that they can see that they are aligned with the vision of the organisation or their path, they've, they've got a mapped out career path, which allows them to progress if they stay with the organisation, then this can be really useful. So you might want to map out this hierarchy. And as I say, this is an example, which is talking about people managers. And then you may want to work out what's the difference in skills um, between those. So being clear about what the difference is as you go up and down a hierarchy. Then if you really want to take it to the next level, so obviously we'll talk about development here, you could start to define, I mean, I've just got examples here, competencies and behaviours that people can demonstrate. So it's really clear and spelled out what you need to demonstrate at each level in that career pathway. And it may well be that if people who are motivated by reward, uh, they can see that they would be on different bandings or reward or get access to training or they, things like parking spaces are probably not so appropriate now, but they get different benefits or packages that might make them feel that they were heading up. So this one here is using different terms rather than it being talked about people managers, it's talking about specialists. So I've got, let's say I'm a project manager, then I become a senior project manager, and uh, then the professional one, these are just language that we're using here where people might go up. And some of you, if you're in a professional services firm, you may already have something like this. But if you're in a smaller business, maybe you could think about how you could come up with something which is light to touch, but it gives people that sense of progression, um, something that they're part of and, and they can see themselves on that journey. So it's a reason to stay with you rather than look elsewhere. And once you've defined what those stages are, then you can put in place aligned development um, programs with them. What I like about the concept of putting in place aligned development programs is that then you can start to have cohorts of people who are part of things. And whether it's virtual or face-to-face, -face, and ideally maybe you'd be able to do a combination of both, but you can, and, and I think that historically online collaboration was quite difficult. People would go on a training course, but if it wasn't if it wasn't face to face, it was like it didn't happen. Now people almost really appreciate the face to face, but it's entirely acceptable to have that as blended program. So some of that learning can be online and people know they can learn from that and they know they can collaborate and build relationships. So maybe you can put something in place which is genuinely blended um, and aligned to the, the gaps or the skills that progression. So this example here, engaged, training programs this is this is actually an example of something I used in my previous role so we had impact which is similar to our impact and influence program for people who wanted to get to team leader level or you know wanted to go to the next level so we had a, a training program there once people became people managers they had a people management program and then as they were becoming more senior they would program more about strategic skills you can align that with whatever specialisms depending on the size of your organization the key is you're building cohorts of people who are collaborating for a reason and they uh, feel a sense of belonging because they're part of their tribe their little tribe of people in that area and that keeps people um, staying in, in organizations at higher levels we've got things like master classes uh, mentoring others again all sense of human to human interaction where you can get that sense of connection and belonging Let's have a quick look at the comments before I go into my um, final slide on talent management strategies. So Mike's saying that he thinks the feeling to remember is the difference between clicking a leave button because you're back on your own, your home office, a quick five minute chat in the office, a conversation, but to keep the environment. So it's just remembering having a, a sort of right. So you're 
that human bit of having that conversation rather than just jumping off something, <coughs> jumping off a webinar like this. So Tori, you've, you've moved to a remote first um, model with a co-located hub, two, three days a week. Um, so you've got some full time to meet. So you, you've really literally gone for it, embraced it, come up with all hands meetings um, and daily interaction. But it's taken longer to onboard. That is a consistent, that's a consistent message and coming through. So, but you've come up, you've embraced it in your business, Tori, and have actually come up saying, right, we will get face to face four times a year minimum. Um, and we've got this opportunity for people to come in if they want to, um, not prescribing it, but regular, regular interaction. But it does take longer to onboard. Interesting. Okay, so then let's look at virtual talent management strategies. So th this is just my summary aspect of this. So some of it's, um, as I said at the start, some of it's about geography. Um, so are we embracing the geography, the lack of need for geography, um, or are we enforcing people to, that we don't need them or want them to be feel forced to do something a certain way? Are we encouraging that culture of collaboration? Um, so putting in place some structures where we can do that. Is it about management style? So are our people managers doing enough of the human stuff? So, um, you know, they might have been doing to start with, are they doing good quality check-ins? Are they um, coaching? And is there enough recognition and reward uh, recognition going on in terms of making people feel valued? Um, can we see the skills that are in our organization and are we facilitating networking to allow uh, you know, more collaborating, collaboration going on? Have you got systems that allow you to see skills and move people around? So things like secondments, certain things that might have happened more easily by who you knew, all of a sudden you can't necessarily see them. So again, if you have systems where you can see skills um, and maybe uh, look up someone who's a particular expert in a certain area, whether it's on your intranet or if you have talent management platforms, then that can allow you to see skills online um, and hopefully utilize them. And again, you could also think of career pathways and aligned development, which gives people a reason to stay in an organization because they can see their journey, but it also has that added belonging um, to do with people being parts of cohorts of training. So those are um, five talent management strategies that I wanted to go through today. It's an ever evolving program um, or process, if you like. Uh, if anyone has any comments or observations, please feel free to do so. Um, yeah, so Brendan's saying that's remembering to be human, isn't it? You know, checking with people, remembering the stuff that you talked with people about before, you know, wherever they did what it was, just keeping those connections going, isn't it? That real human connection, quite easy to forget. Totally. OK, so do feel free to drop any questions or statements. Thank you so much for those who've been actively engaging in the chats. We've gone through this. Um, we've just got linked to this succession planning. We've got a, a white paper that you can access. Uh, just a note in terms of if you are interested in virtual training or want to go and see any of the virtual training programs, we run open programs. Um, obviously, that doesn't give you the belonging with an internal organisation. It depends on the size. So they're perfect for small or mid-sized businesses. We also run these in-house. So we've got businesses that have run Virtual Manager, for example, in-house where you can get that, uh, you can get that effect. In terms of when the next ones start, uh, How to Be Changed Superhero is in February. Virtual manager program is January, but the January one is now full. So we will be putting another one on probably, I would think probably about March. And our new impact and influence course um, will be available kicking off on February the 21st. Those are the dates that are available at the moment. If you want to know any more about those, let me actually just pop up something. Uh, if you'd like us to send you any information on any of those or get one of the teams just to have a chat with you um, about them, let me know and you can do that. Here, I'll just put it up there in case you're interested. Um, this is just to share a little bit more about the impact and influence piece. Um, so yes, this is it's really about self-awareness, emotional intelligence, high performance habits, influencing, asserting and negotiation and innovation and virtual collaboration. So those are all your high impact and influence skills in the hybrid work um, world, whereas the manager one is more about people management. And then just looking ahead to next year, we will have our full um, program up on the on the uh, web website before Christmas. Uh, but we've got a couple of webinars coming up. So in January, we're talking about 
Uh, we've got preparing for hybrid appraisal for managers. So this is something you can send people who are managers if you want them to think about how can they do a, an engaging appraisal working with a hybrid in a hybrid environment. Um, and also we talk about performance management, what's good performance management in that environment. So that's the theme for January. Um, we'll have other themes coming through. Diversity, again, we'll do 360. Again, any themes that you would like us to cover on webinars, please tell me in the chat. I would absolutely love to know. Uh, what do you want us to do more on? Same for the podcast, if you listen to the podcast, what topics you'd like. And our HR Uprising Coffee Club. Um, actually, hopefully... Uh, if you're not a member of the HR Uprising group, I think Caitlin may well be able to pop the link into the chat so you can um, join us there if you wanted to. Um, so the HR Uprising is just our LinkedIn group where we can we post various information and you see things ahead of everybody else. But we've started to do a coffee club. We're probably going to do about six to eight of these a year. It's a, an, an informal networking. It's a way in which you can have belonging with your colleagues and peers. OK, so Ola's just asked me to go back to the virtual talent management strategies for a second. Uh, I think you're talking about this one. This one? Yeah, we'll send you the slides, so Ola. So don't worry, these, these slides will come out to you. So Caitlin will ping something out to you later today, um, but tomorrow. So apologies, some of you've had difficulties. You had difficulties with Zoom, did you? As, uh, so apologies if you struggled to get on. We'll send you the link. Um, and also this has been recorded. So if you want to go and catch up on anything, you will be able to um, do that. All right. So thank you so much for joining today. Uh, I'm going to have to say it, wishing you a happy Christmas. Uh, or a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year if you celebrate Christmas. Um, and if not, a, a nice break. And uh, look forward to seeing some of you ho, 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 in the new year. Thanks for joining us this year. And like I say, any ideas of topics that would make you want to come along and listen, or you'd like me to do some homework on, then I'd really um, love to hear from you because we want to make it as relevant as possible. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>